Christmas. Welcome to the online worship service this Christmas day at Living Savior. Vicar Welch, Pastor Zell, and I are very excited to be able to bring God's word to you today. Before we begin, two quick notes. Please make sure to remove all distractions, maybe silence phones, unless, of course, this is what you're using, but any device that would distract you from the word of God today. And one other one. This is such a good message that we have. In fact, the angel said it is good news of great joy that is for all people. So might you find an opportunity and a person who really could use this message of peace and forgiveness between us and God? Please feel free to share it. And if there's any way that we can help you or anyone else, please feel free to let us know. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. To us a child is born, to us a son is given. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to us, and he is Christ the Lord. And that perfectly explains, as the, the psalmist in the middle of the Old Testament, as they were looking forward to the Savior being born, they would say words such as these, Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of God. So we can even join with the angels and say glory to God in the highest. And yet even as we approach God, God would invite us to come to him with humble and penitent hearts, knowing that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And so we can even say with the Apostle Paul, according to our own acknowledgments, of, of whom I am the worst. So let us pause for a moment and contemplate our sin, confessing our guilt, all the while trusting in Christ our Savior to be our Savior, our Savior and our Redeemer. Let us pray. Merciful God, you tell us that your own dear Son took on human flesh to free us from the guilt of sin. You proclaim to us that his life and death cover our sins. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. In love that astounds us, God sent his son that first Christmas as true God and true man to be our savior. True man so he would take on the weakness of this world with no sin. True God in order that he would live perfectly and die as the sacrifice to atone for, that is to pay for, all of our sins. And so we can sing with the angels and with countless Christians, glory to God in the highest. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that the coming of your only Son in the flesh may set us free from our old bondage under the yoke of sin. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for today, Isaiah 52, will serve as the basis for the sermon. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. The word of the Lord. The gospel for today, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, 
but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace, came, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in close relationship with the Father, has made him known. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What happens when you neglect really important things? Well, what happens when you ignore maintenance on your vehicle? What happens when you don't really care to pay the bills anymore? Or what happens when you neglect people closest to you? Everybody understands that it's important to care for important things. Because if you don't take care of your car, later on down the road, you're going to have to pay a lot of money to either fix it or buy a new one. And if you don't pay your bills, well, things will not go well for you. And nobody wants a relationship a relationship that is strained because of a lack of effort. You understand that it's important to care for things. And that's why you prepare for Christmas. Because Christmas is important to you and you care about it. You look for presents for the ones that you love. You prepare all the meals and you plan all the gatherings because Christmas is important. But imagine for a moment this tragedy. There are children who wake up in the morning not to find presents under the tree, but to find nothing under the tree. And the only reason that there's nothing under the tree is because their parents were indifferent. They neglected to prepare for Christmas. They were lazy about the whole thing. Wouldn't that be awful? I mean, if you were in that position as a parent, wouldn't that be embarrassing? Not because people might call you a Scrooge, but because that goes against the very fiber and nature of what Christmas is all about. How much more serious then, and how much more of a tragedy would it be if we neglected spiritual matters? Because what you believe in your heart has ramifications that go on for ever and ever. A car only lasts for so long. The presents under the tree fade away. But what you believe, that matters for eternity. This Christmas and every Christmas, God gives you a very special gift. And it's the most important thing that you should ever care about because it is the epitome of a spiritual matter. It's God's gift to you. And with this gift, there is a serious danger involved as well when it comes to neglecting it. So how do we avoid this spiritual apathy towards God's gift? And then how do we receive all that God wants to give us and more? How do we receive the things from God this Christmas that are truly important and truly unbreakable? Well, that's what the words of Isaiah 52 tell us. Because long before you, you decided to start Christmas, Christmas shopping, much longer or way before Mary and Joseph made preparations for the first Christmas, God was already preparing his people for Christmas. He made sure that his people were ready by sending prophets to tell them about this Christmas that was coming because he didn't want his people to miss it or lose out on the blessings. He didn't want them to suffer the consequences of neglecting this Christmas gift. And so as we look at the words of Isaiah chapter 52 today, we're going to see that in order to have a truly unbreakable Christmas, we're going to need to break neglect. And just like when you have to reckon with the effects of not caring for a vehicle, so also the Israelites had to deal with the ramifications of their spiritual apathy. For so many years, 
they had neglected God. It was it's a sad story, really. God came to the Israelites and said, I will be your God and you will be my people. All they had to do was care. But they didn't care. And instead of going to God for blessing and comfort and joy, they went to anywhere else. They tried to find blessings and joy and comfort and peace anywhere else apart from, apart from God. God wanted to bless them. He wanted to give them his special gift, but they said, thanks, thanks, but no thanks. It'd be like if you were spending time, a lot of time, looking for the perfect present to give to the one you love. You spent hours searching, maybe even hours making it yourself. You knew this was a good gift. It was something they could use every day. It was something they wanted. It was perfect. You wrapped it up, put a bow on top, and you gave it to them, and they unwrapped it. And their face was disappointed. And when they thought you weren't looking, they threw that gift into the trash. That's essentially what Israel did. For so many years, almost a thousand, actually, they neglected God's gift. And the ramifications of their spiritual neglect, the consequences, eventually came to fruition. They had to deal with the effects. The nation of Babylon, they came in and they obliterated everything. They tore down the walls of their great city, Jerusalem. They knocked down all the buildings and they burned down the temple. They left everything in a giant heap of destruction and rubble. They took anything of value back to Babylon and Israel had nothing. No nation, no city, and it seemed like no God. Israel had hit the spiritual rock bottom because of their neglect towards God. Now I know that you are not quite there. You don't spit in God's face and you haven't spit in God's face for a thousand years now. I know it's not quite that bad. You're not as fall, you're not falling quite as far as Israel has fallen. I understand that, but tell me what's going to happen when you go back to work on Monday? Or what's going to happen when the children go back to school and the routines pick back up and the busyness continues? Or what's it going to look like in three months from now? Might spiritual neglect be able to creep in? It most certainly can. Because it is so easy. It is way too easy to search for peace and comfort in the things of this world. We try to fi find peace and comfort in the things that we buy or the things that we possess, but does that last? No. We build up walls of security and safety around our family and our health and our career. We search for physical well-being. We try to build up all the things that we have in this life at the expense of our spiritual well-being. We think, well, if the family's okay, if the kids are happy, if everyone's doing relatively well, and the bank account is doing okay, well, I guess I'm doing okay too. Spiritual neglect has a way of sneaking in quietly. Your spiritual soul, your soul its health doesn't screech like brakes that need to be changed. It doesn't cry like a hungry child or send you late fees when you forget, like when you forget to pay a bill. No, it goes undetected. You don't even know it's happening. And how does this work out for us? How does it work out for us when we are spiritually neglecting God and not even knowing it, when we're searching for peace and for comfort here and there and over there and anywhere except for God, how does that work out for us? It doesn't. Because nobody can give safety, security, peace and comfort like God can. You don't know spiritual neglect is happening until, well, until you do. And it's in those moments 
when you're feeling the effects of your poor spiritual choices and your neglect, it's precisely in those moments when God does not neglect you. You see, Israel had hit rock bottom because of their spiritual neglect and their poor choices. But it was in that moment, it was for that moment that the prophet Isaiah wrote the words of our sermon text for today. He said, listen. Do you hear that? He's asking the Israelites, do you hear the people shouting for joy amid the rubble and the ruins and the pile of rocks that of the city that used to be Jerusalem. Do you hear that? There are people shouting for joy. Shouting for joy. Why are these people shouting for joy? Why are they happy? How can they not be sad and depressed? What are they happy about? Well, Isaiah says, they will see him coming with their own eyes. People are sitting among the rocks, the ruin and the rubble because and they are shouting for joy because they see God coming to rebuild the city, to restore them with their own eyes. And Isaiah continues, Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. God saw the effects of Israel's spiritual apathy. And he did not say, well, they get what they deserve. <laughs> no. God saw how far his people had fallen and how much they were struggling. And he said, I need to do something. I have to help them. I need to go in there and fix what is broken because I love them. Do you hear it? Do you hear the people shouting for joy on this Christmas morning, bursting into songs? Maybe you might not hear it with your ears right now, but you know that all around the world, Christians are shouting for joy. And why is it that people who are sad and depressed can find joy on this Christmas morning? Isaiah tells us, he says, the Lord will lay bare his holy arm. Today, people are shouting for joy because God himself has come into the world to lay bare his holy arm, to roll up his sleeves, and to go to work. That's what Christmas is all about. God coming into this world to go to work, to fix all that was broken, laying bare his holy arms, rolling up his sleeves, sleeves, grabbing all that is broken and wrong with this world, the superficial peace, the fake comfort, your spiritual apathy, all the effects of your poor spiritual choices. He takes them with his two hands and he breaks it in half. He rolls up his sleeves to go to work because when he came into this world, it was about to get dirty. You see, God did return to, to Jerusalem to that mountain they called Zion. Sometimes they called it Golgotha. It's a place where they would crucify criminals. And it was there on that mountain that your God rolled up his sleeves and in the greatest display of love and care for you, he stretched out his holy arms like this. And nails went through his hands he was lifted up on the cross and he died there for you. Jesus suffered the effects of spiritual apathy. He hit spiritual rock bottom when he experienced hell on the cross in your place. God crushed Jesus there so that with his other hand he could bring you to him. That's what Christmas is all about. It's because of Christmas that God came into this world to roll up his sleeves and break all that was broken. And it's because Jesus came on Christmas that you can have unbreakable gifts, lasting joy and peace because Jesus has restored you, redeemed you. He's come back to you to make you whole again. And God so cares about you 
that he was preparing for this Christmas gift long before Christmas ever started or the first Christmas ever came. And the fact that God was preparing this Christmas for you, it means something. God tells us that this Christmas gift saves you. Isaiah says that all the earth, all the earth sees the salvation of the Lord our God. You live in the earth, so you have seen, you see the salvation of the Lord our God. And that word salvation, it's a really special word. It's the word in Hebrew from, from which Jesus' name comes from. Salvation. That's why when the angel appeared to Joseph and told Joseph that you are to name the baby Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Salvation was his name. So along with the rest of the world today, shout for joy, rejoice, be happy because today salvation has come to you in the flesh. God lay salvation there in the manger, literally Jesus. He lifts the burden of your guilt off of your shoulders. He restores you and takes away your spiritual apathy. He rescues you from the darkness of this world. How timely is a message like this, especially in a year like this. This message provides you with comfort and peace that things of this world cannot. The Israelites knew how timely this was. They had just been told that their city, their everything, their national identity, their temple, everything would be destroyed. And it was in this moment that God told Isaiah to write to his people to give them hope, to give them comfort, that God would not abandon them forever, but that he would return. And he did. So listen to these words of Isaiah as I read them. Sense the excitement, the joy in his mouth when he says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. Beautiful feet, huh? Not because these messengers just took better care of their feet. No, they had beautiful feet because their feet were carrying the message of God's gift to the entire world, to you. Their message had weight and authority. It was legitimate. Their message that peace and good tidings and salvation has come to you. This is the Christmas gift that God gives you. And he doesn't want you to miss out on it. In fact, he made sure that you would not miss out on it by bringing it to you into this world. He brought salvation. He brought Jesus to restore you and he laid him in the manger. So you can know that your salvation is as good as done because what Jesus did is as good as done. What Jesus did and what he gives you this Christmas is truly unbreakable. It's because God cared enough for you to send his son into the world that you can have a truly unbreakable Christmas. You can have a merry Christmas. Amen. Let us pray. On this holy day, dear Father, we rejoice to hear that a Savior has been born for us. What a great mystery of our faith this is, that God has become fully human for our salvation. Your almighty Son is wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. Lead us always to believe that this precious child was born as our substitute to be our Savior. In the midst of our joy, we grieve for the many people who do not know their Savior. As the shepherds spread abroad the good news of Jesus, move us also to tell what we have seen and heard. And as the angels sang their praise, we too sing our praise to you today 
and every day as the joy of Christmas remains in our hearts. Amen. Your Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. On behalf of Pastor Zell, Vicar Welch, and myself, and everyone here at this Living Savior Church family, thank you for joining us today. We wish you all a Merry Christmas. <laughs>